I'm a numbers guy. I've always been a numbers guy. Since I was one, I was number one with numbers. Numbers just make sense to me, but you know what never did? School. I was number one million at school. I got distracted. I get distracted. It's an ongoing problem for me, but never so much as when I was in school. I'd be in school, and the teacher would have a problem on the board, a number problem. I went to school for numbers, and I'd be sitting there with the number problem, trying to make sense of it, and then I'd come across a number like 189. I'd be like, 189, now there's an interesting number. 1 plus 8 equals 9. And those are the numbers that comprise 189. Now that's the kind of story not every number tells. But of course the story doesn't end there. 1 plus 8 equals 9. We all know that. But you take that 9 and add it to the 9 at the other end of 189. Now you got 18. Which is the first two numbers in 189. Now all of a sudden this story's a novel. Say I was 18 once. What an age. That's the kind of path my brain would go down. Then I'd look down at my notebook to see I'd scribbled half a novel about being 18. Suffice to say, I didn't graduate till I was 25. And while all my friends went on to find great jobs in the fields of technology and statistics, I had to take the first shitty personal finance job I could find. My first job out of college, I was crunching numbers for this rich guy. Bad guy. Classic rich bad guy. He was rich, his company was broke, and he wanted me to crunch the numbers, find out who was getting paid too much, and basically clean house. But I hated him even before I knew that. I hated him for the moment I saw him. He looked like my stepfather who looked like Cary Grant, and I hated everyone who ever looked like that. And this rich guy, my boss, he hated me right back. Or else he treated me like he did. I remember it was my first day at my first job out of college. He called me into his office, I shook his hand, he said, Get to work, college boy. He had a voice just like that, it was crazy. So I did. I sat at his desk, looked at his books, and uh, started crunching the numbers. And he started looking at me. I'm starting to feel him looking at me. Glaring. Like he didn't like what he was looking at. So I looked up at him to say, Can I help you? He cuts me off, says, Sorry, am I distracting you? I said, No, I just thought you were looking at me. He said, I was, and you looked distracted. I said, I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry too, college boy. I said, Why are you sorry? And then he said, Because it's distracting to take personal calls at work. Then he pulled out his phone. No one called him, but he pulled out his phone and made a personal call. In fact, I'll say it was the most personal call of all time. He was speaking to a woman, a girl. This girl was audibly young, and she was not his wife. I knew that because he kept saying, Wow, I love how young you are, and how you are not my wife. I'm hearing this, and I'm trying not to hear it. I'm trying to focus on cleaning the books, because... This man's books are dirtier than his phone calls. He's cheating on his taxes like he's cheating on his wife. Like it's a race to see whether this man's going to hell or prison first. Suddenly he starts knocking on my desk with his big fist and he points up at his big blue eyes and he says, College boy, eyes up here. I said, hey, <laughs> what's up? He said, what's up with you? Getting a little distracted? I said, no. He said, I wouldn't blame you if you were. I said, neither would I. Still, I was just cleaning up the books like we talked about. And then the boss laughs. Ho ho! Real forced laugh. Cleaning up the books, eh? Do you know what Freud would say about that? I said, uh, no. Freud said, cleaning is inherently an act of guilt. So what's up? Something you're feeling guilty about? I said, no. He said, then why do I feel like there is? I said, I don't know. Freud might say you're projecting. And that made him laugh a little. <gasps> and the laugh wasn't forced at all. It was scary, and he was angry that he laughed. He looked at me with those big blue eyes and started clapping his big old hands, and he goes, oh, <laughs> yes. I forgot we had a little college boy on our hands. Little college bitch. I said, whoa. 
Boss says, follow me. Then he takes his big hand and grabs my wrist and starts dragging me down the hall. Now I know this is weird. But to paraphrase another great thinker, I also knew that I knew nothing. This was my first job out of college. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what was over the line or if I'd crossed some invisible line. All that I knew was I wanted to get this job done fast as possible so I could start looking for my second job out of college. So I follow the boss to the employee lounge. It's full of people drinking their first cup of coffee in the morning. I'd shaken most of their hands ten minutes earlier when they gave me the tour. Boss says, this is where you work, college boy. I said, I know. And this is who you work for. These people, these hard-working men. These are hard-working men. And you're their college boy. Their coffee kid. You get their coffee so they can return energized to the workplace, which to you seems foreign as the face of the moon. And you get green tea for Wong, who is splendidly foreign to us all. Now at this point, I'm still holding his books in my hand, and I caught myself scribbling, you know, like I always do. I scribbled this little note. This man is the worst piece of shit who ever lived. I'd scribbled that down. And then I thought to myself, maybe I am getting distracted. I am here scribbling notes. Maybe he knows something I don't know. I mean, I looked out at the employee lounge. They all tried desperately not to look at me, except for one man who handed me a cup with a tea bag. I assume he was Wong. I filled his cup and moved onwards towards the coffee. I mean, what am I supposed to do? This was my first job. I didn't know what to expect. I thought maybe this was all part of some customary corporate hazing, which I failed to account for at my accounting job. But then the boss did something unexpected even for him. He apologized. Sorry, college boy, the boss said. I have to take this. And then he takes out his phone and he places a call to the same young girl. Oh, young girl, says the boss. Oh, recently legal girl. You are as recently legal as you are not the woman I married. Makes me want to celebrate. I want to celebrate. I, 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 I want to take you to Greece, where the age of consent is even lower. I don't even need to take you there. I'm just feeling Greece right now, bitch. And so I'm staring at this man, and I'm pretty much ready to quit when he shouts at me, College boy, eyes up here. I said, I'm looking straight at you. He said, and I'm looking at the face of distraction. I say, then there must be a mirror in here. We should both be looking at your books because there's atrocities in there that we need to clean up. Boss says, ho! Oh, Surprise, surprise, the college boy wants to clean again. Tell me, what are you guilty about, college boy? What is it, what is it about me you find so distracting? Do I get you off, college boy? I said, no. But then the boss started elbowing everyone in the room. College boy staring at me like it's my 18th birthday. You falling for me, college boy? You want to take me to the campus cafe for a malt? I said, no. Boss says, you're not ready for this job. <laughs> and he takes my wrist with his big hand, and he pulls me down the hall and out of the building and into his car. He started peeling out of the driveway, and by this point, I was pretty sure he was about to kill me. But instead, he put a big hand on my knee, and he said to me, I want to make you a promise. I said, what? Boss said to me, I promise I'll never be harder on you than I am on myself. I said, uh, really? You seem to be quite generous with yourself. He said, oh, I've got my number, college boy. Don't worry about that. I know I'm not perfect. I said, me too. He said, because I care too much about perfection. That's all this is. I, I, I'm not punishing you right now. I'm pushing you. This is how I help. You're a young man with a big job and you're distracted and I want you to succeed. So he drove us up to his house, big house, classic, big, rich guy house. He dragged me inside, and it was filthy. It smelled like cigarettes, like a smoker's teeth. There was an 18-year-old girl, half-dressed on his couch, whose voice I recognized, uh, and when we walked in, she whispered, Grease ASAP, and she blew the boss a kiss. Boss smiled. These kids today and their texting abbreviations. 
She's just 18. Incredible age. The first one that's legal. Unless, of course, you're in Greece. Why am I here? I asked. Because, said the boss, this is your first job out of college. Then the boss handed me a toothbrush and some soap. You're so obsessed with cleaning. Your first job out of college is to clean my house. I said, I quit. He said, hey, college boy, eyes down here. And he swept my legs so that I fell to my knees. So I'm on my knees and I hate my boss. And by this point, I'm very afraid of him. So I, I, I take this toothbrush that he's handed me and I start scrubbing the floor with it, keeping my head down, focusing on work. My boss said, it's a blessing and a curse. I don't ask him what, fuck him. He continues, this face, it's a blessing and a curse. I said, what? My boss said, it's always had this effect on people. I've, I've always been, what's the word? Distracting. I said, you forgot that word? Boss said, I just don't want you to think that I'm mad at you. I get it, you know, I get you. I said, I don't, I don't think you're distracting the way that you think you are. Boss says, frankly, if you thought a little less about me and more about your work, your first job out of college might not have been cleaning houses. And finally, I've had it. I, I, I said to him, listen, man. If I seem distracted, it's only because all day I've been trying to think of one man I've met in my entire life who I found to be more repugnant than you, and I can't. The name that keeps coming to mind is Hitler, but I obviously never had the pleasure of meeting Hitler. So it's you, and that made the boss laugh. To my boss, the idea that I found him repugnant was actually laughable, so I emptied the clip on him. I said, man, you're so ridiculous, it's actually laughable. You're like the classic rich bad guy. You're, you're, you're cheating on your wife, you're fucking over your employees, you're a joke. I would laugh in your face if the sight of you didn't make me sick. But as I'm talking, the boss takes his big fist, and starts knocking on the spot that I've been cleaning over and over again with the toothbrush. He says, hey college boy, eyes down here. I look down at the spot that I've been scrubbing and the sight that I saw made me sick. I've heard stories about old ladies who see Jesus in pieces of burnt toast. Miracles, you know. Well, this was the opposite. I looked down and saw that in big, soapy, cursive letters, I had scribbled out the words, I love you, boss. I was speechless. The, the, the boss had plenty to say. He said, don't be embarrassed. This happens more often than you think. I said, what happened? The boss said to me, Freud might say you're projecting a little bit. I said, I don't think so. I don't think you know what that means. Boss says, speaking of Freud, I have sympathy for your deep-seated and humiliating feelings for me, but don't for one second think that means I'm gonna let you mouth off and tell lies about me. I say, I'm not lying. I, I, I really think you're repugnant. I don't know how this happened. And then the boss laughed. He said, no, no, the other lie. You said I was cheating on my wife. That's absurd. I said, I really think you're cheating on your wife. And absurd and insidious ways. And with a child, you, you were having that disgusting conversation with your girlfriend. Boss said, my girlfriend? Do you mean my daughter? I said, no, no, I don't think so. At, le uh, at least I hope not. Boss said, I call my beloved daughter twice a day. I call my beloved daughter twice daily at work. Is that a crime? I said, well, <laughs> You were saying a lot of crime-like stuff, you know, you were telling her how young she is. You said you're glad she's not your wife. My boss said, of course I am. That would be disgusting. I said, you, you, you said the age of consent is lower in Greece and you were going to take her there, but you didn't have to. And boss said, no, I don't have to. But I want to give her the world. I want her to grow up with culture like I didn't. Meet the enlightened folks that I never met when I was working through my boyhood as the lucky lads left for college. And yes, if one of the enlightened folks she meets should so happen to be 16 or even 15 for that matter, 
and she chose to bestow upon them the physical act of love. I would support her through that. I would love my daughter if she were a Greek pedophile. I looked down and realized that I'd scrubbed the words great dad over and over again. I scrubbed them away. No, no, this can't be happening. You're not a great dad who I love. You're, you're a rich slob who I hate. A classic rich slob who got rich moving numbers around while the people under you worked. And whenever those numbers started catching up with you, you hire someone new to clean up your books. Clean up the mess you made while, while the people who work under you disappear, you slob. My boss said to me, Is that what you think? Is that why you think I hired you? To clean house? I said, Look where we are. I'm literally cleaning your house. Boss said, But not figuratively. I'd never tell you to figuratively clean my house. I said, When you hired me, you said, I want you to crunch the numbers, college boy, find a redundant salary, and clean house. Boss said, I wanted you to crunch me. I said, What? Boss said, I wanted you to crunch me, but you weren't ready for the job. The college boys never are. They come into my workplace, crunch my numbers, and tell me to fire my hardworking men. Fire this person. Fire that person. You can't afford a personal pilot. You have to fire him. And you know what happens? I fire the college boy because the numbers distract them from the big picture. The big picture is people. I don't fire people. I fire college boys. And then I don't file my taxes. I don't pay taxes. Is that a crime? I said, yes. He said, then I'm guilty. I said, yes, you're going to be found guilty as charged. He said, but I won't be as guilty as you, college boy. Just look at you. Still cleaning. Freud would have a field day. I promise you one thing. No man is guiltier than the one who committed crimes against his own heart. I need you to listen to yours and do the thing I brought you here to do. Then the boss wrapped his fist around the spot I've been cleaning idly, where Soapy Bubbles currently spelled the words, crunch him. I took a deep breath. Boss, looking at the numbers, it, it, it is my considered professional opinion that you need to step down as the head of this company. He said, tell me I'm fired. I said to him again, uh, you should certainly step down, yes. Boss said, no, I want you to say you're fired. I said, I, I can't fire you, I'm not your boss. Boss said, no, you're a college boy, but if you love me like you say you do, then you're gonna act like a college man and crunch me like one of your precious numbers. Fire me, fire me, college man, fire me. I looked up at my boss and I told him, you're fired. And the boss let out a deep sigh it seemed he'd been holding in since the day he became a boss. Thank you. Tears, the color of his powder blue eyes, streamed down the boss's face. His big hand grabbed my wrist and gave it a kiss. Goodbye, he grinned. I said, where are you going? He said, Greece, ASAP. And he blew me another kiss. He'd become so affectionate all of a sudden. I said, but boss, this is your house. The boss tossed me his keys as his daughter followed him towards a charter jet which had apparently been waiting for them. No, he said. This is the boss's house. He climbed into the passenger seat. Wong was his personal pilot. When I saw Wong, I reflexively ran to the kitchen to grab him a cup of green tea. When I came back outside, they were gone. On my way back inside, I slipped on a puddle which I had been scrubbing earlier and landed on the words, World's Best Boss. I felt I should win some sort of prize for bringing new meaning to the phrase Freudian slip. That's not what I got. Uh, the police showed up about five minutes later and gave me 50 years in prison. Uh, my former boss left an unanonymous tip that the man who fired him was cheating on his taxes. Oh well, jail isn't so bad. You just gotta find ways to distract yourself. Never been a problem for me. My roommate hates it, and I hate him. <laughs> I think he looks like John Hamm with scars. 
He thinks I'm messy because I keep a big tally on the wall of how many days I've been here. 189 so far. 189. Now there's a great number. <laughs>